Hey you folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to a preview of Imperator Rome. Imperator Rome is the next grand strategy game that is going to be released by Paradox Development Studios, the same people who brought us things like Europa Universalis, and Crusader Kings, and Hearts of Iron, and Victoria, and Stellaris, although Stellaris, I guess, isn't a grand strategy game, but they're all really good stuff. We don't know when Imperator Rome is coming out, other than, I think, sometime vaguely in 2019, which means the game has anywhere from one month to 13 months of development left. The the build we were on at this press event was fairly early, um, plenty of things were still missing, there were certain aspects of the game that the developers were like, oh please don't show the screen because it looks like butt, um, and while we were able to record our full sort of two days worth of gameplay, um, we are limited in uh, uh, showing no more than 30 minutes of video, uh, just again, again, it's because there's, there's so much stuff that's unfinished, you'll see later on in the video when I uh, form a certain nation, you know, there's missing localization tags and, and things like that, but um, the event was a lot of fun, and at the end of every day, I think everyone wanted to just continue to play more and more and more. People played a large variety of nations. Everyone started with Rome itself, actually, because there's a tutorial in the game uh, at, to play as Rome. And some people chose to continue to play as Rome, either as part of the tutorial or they restarted and just played from scratch. Lots of people jumped into Egypt, which looked like it was actually a really interesting nation to play. Um, we had a bunch of people play. Uh, Macedon, I think, was one of the other recommended nations, which is apparently quite fun to play if you want to play a monarchy, because of course there's many different government types. Rome ha is a republic, it's got its whole Senate thing, there's tons of different factions to balance, and you've got to keep people in the Senate on your side so that they will vote to take take the actions that you want. Of course, you can override the Senate and then earn tyranny points, which is a whole other thing that tends to let you stab in the back by, you know, all your best friends. Um, I chose to play as a small Gaulish tribe, um, basically where, you know, in, in the in general vicinity of where you might find Belgium today, because I'm all about that kind of thing. Um, and the po political system there was very different, in, in a certain sense, much, much simpler. There were some chieftains and there was you, and you can basically do whatever you want. And when you died, one of the other chieftains took over. Um, but I actually did have an issue at some point where after I died and one of the other chieftains took over, that chieftain wasn't very well liked by the rest of the people in the group. And so if I'd been more sort of savvy to that and I would have kept a better eye on, you know, who might be the next person to to lead my country, I might have wanted to really make sure to manipulate things to either try to make that guy more liked or try to make sure that that guy didn't get elected because it was really kind of difficult to deal with the, uh, the low loyalty situation that I went and inherited. Anyway, without further ado, we're going to jump into my gameplay footage here as, um, as Manapa, I think is the name of the actual nation I was playing, which have the Belga culture over in, uh, sort of northeastern France-ish area, maybe. It's hard to pin down exactly. It's like right next to the giant wasteland that is basically Germany in this version of the game. Um, so I don't know, like, you know, I don't really know European geography that well, so I don't know if I effectively started in the Netherlands or Belgium or still in France or whatnot, but I'm sure there'll be people in the comments clarifying the geography for me. All right, here we are. We're going to be loading in to our game as Manapa, which is a Gaulish Druidic tribal nation over here on the north coast, or Manapia, that's what it is, and squished in against the sort of totally uncivilized or uncolonized sort of German lands over here. There are people that are living in Germany um, already. There are pops that are present there, but they're not in formal nations, and uh, colonization works very differently in this game, and hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit later. There is, there's so much to address. I'm going to try to do some of the play-by-play -play of what's on screen, but in practice um, you're, you're going to have to sort of pause and check some of these things yourself as we talk about some of these mechanics. One of the things you can see me looking at right now is the population mechanic in this game. So, um, the developers have said this game is going to feel maybe like 50% Europa, maybe 30% Crusader Kings, 20% Victoria, somewhere around there. Like, it's really hard to pin down. To me, it scratches the same itch as Europa, which is to say sort of like you know, map painting and embiggening the font of your name on the map, and that part feels good, but the mechanics involved are completely different. It, it is a, a substantially different game, although again, to me, Scratch is the same sort of itch. Um, the pops in this game are really sort of inspired maybe by the same mechanics as Victoria, or actually if you play Stellaris, especially Stellaris after 2.2, this will also feel quite familiar. There are four tiers of population available in each city here. There are slaves, 
tribesmen, freemen, and citizens. And they each give you something fairly substantially different. Um, the lower tiers tend to be better for economy. In particular, the slaves are basically um, very, very much influential in your economy. And in particular, if you have more than 15 slave pops in a province, or sorry, in a city, we're going to have to get some of this terminology down, I'll explain in a second, then uh, you produce an additional trade good, which is unbelievably powerful. However, on the other end of the spectrum, your citizens, which are your highest class of pops in a city, are the ones that tend to generate research, for example. And playing as a tribal, there's a persistent warning at the top of the screen that like, oh, I have a bad like research ratio because I have very few citizens. Citizens are really only happy in a fairly civilized nation. And playing as a tribal, your civilization level is fairly low. So it's actually quite hard to maintain a large pool of citizens, which means as a result, you're going to be teching a lot slower than say, you know, Rome with its, its brilliant civilization. Technology in this game works quite differently from most things. There's the true technology, which you can see these advances over here on the left side of the current screen, um, the martial, the civic, the oratory, and the religious. And those mostly tick up over time as a combination of your citizen count, as well as various other factors like who's in charge of the research. Um, and it's fairly non-interactive. The really interactive bits are the so-called inventions, which you spend, uh, I believe, civic points. There are four different types of kind of monarch points in this game, military, civic, oratory, and religious. And they are not, unlike EU4, they are not, you know, the, one of their primary goals is not technology, other than the civic research, which allows you to unlock invention. Inventions are permanent boosts for your nation, such as 10% increased tax, or minus 10% aggressive expansion uh, penalty, or um, a bo permanent bonus to discipline forever, which is amazing. However, the cost of taking inventions goes up every time you take an invention. Um, and so when I'm playing here, I, I sort of, you know, you, you, it's one of those things where like, okay, well, it was very easy to understand that you could click the button to get this bonus, but the long-term implications were something that I didn't realize until I was done with our recording session for the day. You're really building Building your country like forever the things you pick now are gonna be around forever and the costs go up so you can't keep picking infinite numbers of inventions you really have to be kind of strategic uh, in terms of what do I need now versus what I'll need in the late game or mid game or what I'll need in the late game and so on and so forth um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of min maxing discussion about different um, paths over here for these inventions. So that, that's the sort of pop look over there. The other thing with the pops is that each unit of pop has both a culture and a religion. And um, that is really one of the biggest things that is, I think, going to determine your ability to sort of like freely expand in this game. Um, in particular, one of the things, and you'll see this later on, um, is that aggressive expansion is a mechanic in this game, but it doesn't work like in most other games. Yeah, it makes other people not like you as much, but at least in the build that I was in, there weren't there wasn't really like sort of a coalition system to come and spank you if you did too much aggressive expansion. The problem is each unit of pop has a happiness rating and pops that aren't of your culture their happiness is directly affected by aggressive expansion. So the pops of your culture are like, yeah, it's fine, man. We'll take more territory. Sure, we could use some more living space. This seems fine. But the other people are like, man, this guy running the country is a big jerk face and we hate him and the, the province becomes disloyal. And a disloyal province basically does nothing. It produces nothing and you ha have almost no control over it whatsoever. So fixing a disloyal province is extremely tricky to do, as I will find out later in, in this particular run here as a Metopia, Monopia, whatever I'm called. I don't know. Let's talk about trade because we got a trade good coming up over here. So trade is one of the other things that is hugely important in this game and quite powerful. And people are going to spend so much time sort of min-maxing this and figuring out like, what's, what's a proper sort of build order for trade goods, especially early in the game. And again, versus mid game versus late game. There are, there's a ton of different trade goods that you can see on that screen. And each province, okay, hold on, let me back up here. In Imperator Rome, the map, each little subset, the tiniest little part of the map is actually called a city. What we would call in uh, say Europa Universalis, a province in Rome is referred to as a city. And what uh, in Rome they call either a province or a state is, is almost like an area, is a grouping of cities. Uh, so if you pause the screen here, you'll see like, you know, the province of Morinia and province of Morinia has multiple cities within it. Um, the cities are where you build buildings, the cities are where pops live, and the cities are what produce trade goods. However, the city itself and the trade good that it produces doesn't kind of matter there. Instead, all the trade goods produced by the, the cities in a province are accru accrued in a province and it is 
the trade goods that are present in the province that do stuff. Each trade good simply by existing in a province gives you some bonus in that province. In addition to that, there is a bonus to having a surplus. Um, and a, having a surplus of a good, so at least one extra copy of a good in a province, gives an additional bonus to that province. And those bonuses can accrue. So if you have two, three, four, five extra uh, examples of that trade good, that keeps going. Either more growth or more happiness or, or so on and so forth. Um, in addition to that, if the province with the surplus is your capital, then you actually get another nationwide bonus for having surplus. And again, that continues to stack. So choosing from these, I don't know, 20, 30 trade goods? I actually don't know what the count is. Certainly over 20, I'm sure. Uh, different trade goods and, and planning. Which one should I plan to have a surplus, a surplus of in my capital um, is incredibly important. And on top of that, people can go and um, import your goods. They can basically purchase your goods. Um, you can export goods to other people if they come and would like to import some of your goods in there. Um, and there's another bonus for exporting a good. And you don't actually have to produce it yourself. You could just import. Let's say I don't have access to iron, but I start importing because I want to be able to make heavy infantry and I've got the surplus. And someone else comes to me and says, hey, I noticed you have some iron. I can't import it from anyone else. Could you send me some iron? And by saying yes, I will get a bonus because I'm exporting that iron. So there's tons of ways to like stack these things. So there's a fairly substantial sort of economic model there um, that you are going to plan. It's a little abstracted, but I think it's going to be one of the most influential aspects of the game. Oh, it's hard to say. There's so many of them. Then you've got all your people that you've got to keep happy. Even in the tutorial playing as Rome, I actually, I just, as a habit, I went and grouped up all my army as a, a single giant, giant army stack, and I put my best general in, in charge of that, and it was great. I was going around stomping everyone, except with every victory the general was having, his popularity was going up, and with higher popularity, the troops, the, the cohorts is what it's referred to in, in here, um, became loyal to him specifically, and that's actually good because Troops that are loyal to their general actually fight with a greater bonus, which is wonderful. Except at a certain point, basically all the troops became loyal to that general personally. And then the general was like, hey, I basically control every single troop in Rome, and they're all loyal to me specifically as opposed to the state. Um, Civil War? Civil War? Civil War sounds pretty good. Uh, let's go and overthrow the government. So... I mean, that's never happened in, in actual Roman history. No, that would be ridiculous. Um... So I learned that lesson pretty quick. Keep your armies separated and small and have multiple generals going on, even if it means that some of your armies are led by maybe somewhat lower skilled generals, because otherwise you might have some problems. Uh, oh, you can see an example on the screen there. Pops are fairly mobile. You can uh, order them to be moved from, from country to country. It does cost you some of your points. I don't remember if it's civic points or orator points or whatnot to go and do that, but you can move your, your pops around. Um, you can also promote pops to a higher tier, uh, which I did do at the beginning of this Let's Play here because I was trying to um, uh, elevate some of my uh, freemen to citizens so I could get some more tech rate. And then and then I ran to the thing, right, 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 my citizens won't really be happy because we have low civilization value. Although you can counter that by doing things like building marketplaces or importing the right kind of goods. I'm trying to remember, is it wine that makes citizens happy? No, I think wine is for freemen. I think olives... All of those are for slate. I don't remember, but there's different goods associated with happiness of different uh, different pops. Um, you can choose province policies with your governors as well. When your governors uh, take control over a province, they sign their own policy, but you can override it, which is the hint of tyranny points for that. Uh, and it turns out later on that's actually going to be a very important tool that I use to uh, improve the loyalty of my provinces. Because here I am, I'm very, I'm fairly freely expanding here. Um, you know, there's plenty of game balance, game mechanics that haven't been balanced yet. Uh, in particular, some of the buttons like um, sieging, like in sieging down a fort or assaulting a fort, basically is like in this current build was basically instant and didn't cost you any troops. And you know, uh, imprisoning people and assassinating people was basically like guaranteed in this particular build. Um, so uh, it was really easy for the people in in this particular um, uh, preview to to expand pretty freely here. And uh, I think they did that so that we could go pretty much. Oh, there you go. Here's here's a little notice about a civil war. <coughs> this is my Gaulish game. You can see here I decided to just imprison someone to deal with that. And then shortly after. Uh, possibly as a side effect of recruiting some tyranny from imprisoning uh, some disloyal generals, um, now there's going to be a civil war because we have some disloyal provinces. And this was a place where I sort of got checkmate with my aggressive expansion. So I was growing very quickly. I was absorbing lots of people of different cultures and different religions, and their happiness goes down directly as a factor of aggressive expansion. My budding empire 
was slowly starting to collapse in on itself. In, in a very sort of classic Roman way, right? It's it, Rome didn't get destroyed by external forces, it got taken down by internal forces. And I'm not playing as Rome here, but the very same thing happened here. I was ignoring the internal politics, and that is much more important. I think this is one of the big things if you were to compare this to EU4. It, in addition to the fact that virtually every single mechanic in the game is, is quite different. Um, Oh, here I save right before the start of the, uh, the Civil War, because it was like, if I do this badly, I want to be able to reload and keep, keep playing the save. Um, the big thing is that EU4 is mostly about being concerned with external forces, um, and those are the largest threats. But if you think about something like Victoria, which is all, a lot about internal trade and economy, or Crusader Kings 2, which is mostly about internally keeping your vassal happy, uh, Rome is much more like that. It's, you're going to be much more concerned with the internal state of your nation because that's what's ultimately going to cause you to collapse if you ex expand too quickly or too poorly. You're really going to want to like babysit these provinces, make sure that everyone is happy. You're going to want to keep um, keep an eye on the various populations, again, for both keeping your production and your economy going. You need enough, uh, I can't remember if it's tribesmen or freemen that are primarily the source of manpower, but you're going to want to have a lot of them and keep them happy. And then your citizens, you're going to want a bunch of them and keep them happy so you can actually improve in technology. Um, um, and and yeah, I kind of like at some point in here I realized, oh yeah, yeah, I've been playing with a very external eye on the world, and uh, and especially in this build, there are there were defensive packs and different things like that, um, and a lot of people, especially people playing in Great Britain, got completely spanked by uh, chains of alliances and defensive packs while they tried to do things. Uh, apparently Great Britain was particularly difficult to be to be warlike in because uh, I, 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 in a sense to me it's like it reminds me of the stories of people playing in the HRE in EU4. Uh, expanding there you, you got you got really spanked because there's a lot of there's tons of nations in Great Britain, lots of small nations. Um, but yeah. Uh, one thing that's interesting, Ireland starts off as effectively like uncolonized, right? No no major nations in there. And oh, I didn't actually talk about expansion or colonization. Colonization in this game is pretty interesting. All you have to do is have a city adjacent to a quote unquote uncolonized land, and the city has to have at least 10 population in it. And effectively, all you do is move population to the adjacent uncolonized place. Um, and then you just, you know, you're just come showing up and bringing a flag. And they, so those people don't have flags, therefore you can just incorporate them into your country. Um, so population growth and things are very important, but at the same time, there are already people living there. And so, you know, you, you very quickly bring them into your nation. It's not like EU4 where it takes a long time with your settler to go and expand there, but you're going to show up with one loyal pop and there's going to be like six or seven pops that are already there with a different culture, a different religion, and they're not going to like you a ton. And in fact, the disloyal provinces here that, that led to the civil war were mostly the ones on the border, some of which I took from other nations, but also colonies or places that I expanded into. And we just had this mismatch and sl growing slower, but making sure to do more culture and religious conversion would have been really important. Or the other thing is um, spending some points, moving some of those pops around. So bringing some of these like uncultured, unreligious, people more into my main holding territory so that um, you know they would be they would be sort of shut down by my friendlies um, yeah oh my god there's so much more to talk about but again we were a little bit limited in how much footage we could we could put I am uh, very excited for this game at this point I, I do this thing where I, I try to anti-hack myself when I find out about a new game if it's super far away I don't let myself get excited because I just know I'm gonna be miserable but at this point I'm super pumped oh my god we didn't even talk about like military traditions Oh my gosh, um, so each country has three different lines of uh, military traditions you can choose from. You work your way from top to bottom, that's what you can spend military points on. Um, and you can you can work on all three simultaneously, although you'll be fairly strongly incentivized to stick to just one as much as possible because there's an extra bonus for finishing the whole tree. So it's not a huge deal to spread yourself around because it's not the world's giantest bonus to necessarily finish a tree, but there is an incentive to get there, especially as you get a little deeper. If you've gotten, you know, out of, so the, again, you've got three different ones um, and there's seven in each. And so if you're like, you know, four or five deep in one, you really do want to finish it for the extra bonus. And there'll be different emphasis. Like, are you going to be more cavalry focused versus this? Oh, did I talk about the units? There's like, how many different types of units are there? Nine, 10, 11, 12, something like that. Um, everything from, you know, your, your light infantry, archers, heavy intrus, if, infantry, light cavalry, heavy cavalry, chariots, and actually starting as a tribal where you don't really have access to proper horses, uh, you're, you're going to use chariots as your sort of flanking units rather proper cavalry for a long time and then um uh 
Uh, then you've got war elephants and camels and things like that. And, like, it, it's super stupendous. And everyone's got, like, every type of unit has a different bonus and penalty versus every other type of unit. Um, and then on top of that, for each army, you can choose a strategy to go into, which can be countered by another defensive strategy. So there's going to be a lot, especially in multiplayer, it's sort of like this rock, paper, scissors thing with strategy. Uh, one thing people figured out is you could sort of st maybe start a battle with one general, see what strategy the other guy's using, and then use a reserve army with your better general to move in and have him take over with a different strategy. Although there's a risk to engaging with only half your army at a time um, and trying to survive long enough for you to be able to go and switch strategy mid-battle. That's going to be really cool. We do have to wrap this up here, unfortunately. <sighs> it is going to be a big, monstrous game. Like, lots of stuff in it. Very excited for it. Do not know when the release date is going to be. Again, lots of things that were um, still unfinished um, in the build that we're playing in. Uh, this is, um, you know, getting a press preview build is fairly common in the gaming industry. This is not a press preview build. This is, this is something much, much, much earlier and uh, much rougher than your standard press event. There's gonna be uh, probably some other much more standard press event for this closer to release. And then people are gonna get their, their advanced code so they can write you know um, articles for their magazines or make preview videos and so on and so forth. And even those won't be in an unfinished state. So uh, it is really interesting to get our hands in this game so damn early in the development cycle. Um, and it is just, it has been enough to very much just whet my appetite uh, for the full game. Um, again, after every session, all I kept thinking about is all the things, okay, here's what I would do different this time. Here's what I feel that I learned from this particular run. Uh, again, I, t I did a lot of talking in this video about like this whole like, okay, I've really, really got to concern myself a lot more with internal politics because this isn't EU4. And if you play like EU4, you're going to just shatter your nation under rebellion and also not really uh, improve your economy in the right way. Um, there's really a lot of opportunity to, I think, grow taller in this game because, um, especially, weirdly, especially in these tribal areas, a lot of the land starts off pretty weak. Expanding your territory doesn't necessarily do that much, although consolidating provinces has a lot of value. And also, you're going to be doing a lot of hunting for resources. For example, if you know that one of your neighbors has access to iron, either in his own province or has the ability to trade with someone, like if you, if we could expand to the, say, the southern coast and gain access to the Mediterranean and start importing war elephants from Carthage or something like that, holy crap, that changes our country completely. Um, so, conquest will really be determined by a very, very different set of priorities. Uh, and there is a lot of opportunity to grow internally to, rather than build a bunch of training camps, which increases your manpower, instead you might focus heavily on granaries. You can stack buildings in this game. So each um, each city has X number of building slots based on its population, and you can just keep leveling up. There's, there's basically four types of buildings. There's marketplaces, which increase your commerce income commerce is a whole other thing which goes up with trade and all kinds of other values it's one so you can make tax money you can make commerce money and so on and so forth so marketplaces increase commerce income as well as making your citizens happy um training fields i think or training camps i don't know increase your manpower and make one of your other pop types happy granaries increase your your growth um speed as well as making i think your slaves happy and then there's forts and um you can keep stacking them, so they're, they're levels. It's like one level of granary, two levels of granary, 10 levels of granary, and you could keep doing that. Instead of working to increase your manpower um, multiplier by building training camps, you can just, I'm gonna build a ton of granaries, boost my population like crazy, which of course will increase my manpower over time as well, but then just have a massive, massive economy and tax base and power there, even though I might stay small. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that you can play both tall and wide. Of course, this being, you know, Rome, I mean, if you think of Rome and you think of a of an empire that grew incredibly wide. So I think there's going to be a lot of things thematically that work that way. Uh, and I'm very eager to give it a go. Some people did play multiplayer at the event as well. I did not because I was more interested in poking around the mechanics and doing a lot of gameplay at speed four and five to try to like rush forward and see um, what would develop that way. But um, I think this is going to be a really fun and exciting multiplayer game as well, especially when you combine the fact that you've got like Europa style expansion with CK style like assassination of characters. Like I had stories of one guy who found a way to assassinate an enemy general mid-combat, uh, which may or may not be something that makes it to, to release, but 
Holy cow, that's really fun to think about. Thanks for watching, folks. I look forward to the, getting a proper preview key, pro I, I suspect, in a couple of months or more. Uh, I don't, again, no idea. No idea when this game is going to be available um, uh, for, for anything like that. We don't have a release date, but I want to play. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.